Hey everybody, it's the Plant-Based Business Hour. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. I am so happy to have you here with me. Breaking news all day long. I'm going to get into it with my friend on the other side of the pond. Willem Blom joins me from Europe today. He's an impact investor and he does so much for the plant-based community. Willem, thanks for being with me. Thanks so much for having me, Elizabeth. And uh, congrats on the launch of uh, that tech index. Well, okay, so how kind is Willem that we start his interview with, um, I guess I'll say my news, but it's really the news of my partner and I, Sasha Goodman. We have created VegTech, the first global vegan impact and innovation index. We're so excited about it. It's an index like any other, the Dow Jones Index, the NASDAQ 100. We track a basket of globally traded plant-based stocks. Yes, there are. 20 globally traded plant-based stocks, enough to make a basket, enough to track, so that we can look at the performance. Right now it's monthly, soon it will be weekly. We can look at the performance of these stocks and determine the health of the market, which we all know is robust. Absolutely. So what I love about this is, this is the great point of the plant-based business hour is that right before in the green room, we were talking about that list and Willem said, gosh, there are a couple there that I didn't know existed. And then he was kind enough to share with me a couple of his additions that he wants to see make it to the index. So if you all go to vegtechindex.com and you see that there's a company you know about that we didn't get in there, everyone let us know. This is a group effort um, and it's very exciting to track what's going on in the plant-based um, business community around the world. Speaking of that, let's focus on Europe. So on this show, just naturally, because I'm in Los Angeles, I split my time between Los Angeles and California, uh, Los Angeles and Chicago. We, you know, 80% of the time end up talking about what's going on in North America, but really Europe is on fire or is it not? Willem, walk us through this. There's been some very frustrating news coming out of the EU. At first, I thought they were quite supportive of plant-based meat. They were allowing some regulatory changes in terms of um, labeling, but then they backtracked for plant-based dairy. I'm still mad about it. We're talking about Amendment 171. Fill us in, please. Yes, uh, thanks so much for having me on the show. And uh, it, it is indeed uh, a weird ride, so to say, what is happening here in Europe. On the one side, you really see a shift towards a plant-based diet among uh, a big part of the European community. So flexitarianism is on the rise. Veganism is on the rise. Actually, the amount of vegans in Europe has doubled over the past two years with Veganuary loss uh, in, in January taking place. A lot of Europeans participated in that. We see great companies rising. I mean, if you look at the companies from Europe, we have Oatly going to be uh, IPO'd in, uh, in two months. Uh, there, there are other great companies like uh, Upfield that was uh, acquired by KKR, Dr. Evil of Wall Street, that is from the, the Netherlands, actually, where I'm, I'm based. And that is uh, already a unicorn with an 8 billion valuation. Um, there's Live Kindly from Switzerland that, that acquired many different companies in, uh, in the different European markets. So they're great examples of even large companies in, in Europe, but also a lot of startups, scale ups that I, I'd love to talk about later on. But you're right. Um, yeah, the European government uh, hasn't been really supportive of this trend. Um, on the one side, they've uh, written this program called Farm to Fork, where they elaborate that indeed plant-based diets are better for the planet and also for the health of Europeans. But then we have a very strong agricultural lobby taking place here in Europe. And what we've seen with Amendment 171 is that the dairy lobby is fierce and is, is, is really yeah, uh, influencing politicians. Uh, their lobby is, is stronger, I think, than the plant-based lobby, although growing uh, at this moment. So what we've really seen here is, is, a, is a fight between, obviously, um, the farm to fork strategy and the new green deal that is uh, being shaped uh, in the in the upcoming years here in Europe versus yeah the traditional uh, uh, industry and and uh, their fight for um, yeah the status uh, keeping the status quo and what is interesting as well there's been many research on do Europeans uh, feel um, at one point influenced by name conventions like uh, calling something oat milk or uh, dairy replacer and it turns out that the majority of europeans are not 
So for uh, the majority of Europeans, I think it's 90 or 95 percent, they absolutely see the difference between non-dairy and dairy milk. Uh, but mm. the dairy lobby is trying to yeah. Uh, yeah, let us believe that there is indeed uh, something from a customer perspective that needs to be fixed. Well, so there's so much to unpack there because, yes, there is the influence of the lobby, which is pushing back on naming regulations. Um, And by the way, that has backfired before. One need only look at the Swedish dairy lobby that pushed Oatly to put their CEO in a field and and sing a song, which then turned that company around and was later shown on the Super Bowl. So, you know, be careful what you wish for because the stupidity of dairy lobbies can be turned against them. Um, But to me, it's not just the confusing regulatory perspectives about how they're pushing back on dairy and how they're also, um, but they're sort of accepting plant-based burgers, let's say, that that kind of terminology to fly. It's also, I think they've been actively advertising against plant-based products, perhaps I should more accurately say actively advertising for meat. I'm sorry that the campaign is, name isn't coming to mind, but I ran it on my plant-based minute news when there was a, a campaign where they showed people eating meat and they were like, meet the real plants or something like this. Do you know what I'm referring to? If not, I'll go yes, and find yeah, it. So oh, you do know what I'm referring to. Indeed, uh, there, there, there are marketing budgets from the European Commission uh, that can be spent on promoting the consumption of meat and dairy. And uh, indeed, it's 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 a legacy fund, but it's still uh, prevalent right now. And there's another example coming out of France uh, last week, where the city of Lyon, the second oh, biggest yes. city of France, wanted yes. to enable uh, vegetarian school lunches. And the mayor said to to schools, "Well, let's let's offer uh, healthy meals for our kids." But then the French minister of agriculture said, yes. "We don't want ideology on our plates, so you should revert this back to meat first." Well, if there's anything that is ideological, it's it's eating meat, I would say. Well, well, yes. And if there's anything more financially irresponsible, if you look at the healthcare costs of a society, then it would be to push foods, you know, meat, but also processed foods, et cetera. It would be to push foods that make the consumer sick because ultimately you have to pay for that. So it's not a long-term strategy. Um, So it's interesting that you say to me that there have been studies done that European consumers can tell the difference. Oh, gosh, I guess they're not as dumb as everyone thought. They can tell the difference between plant-based milk and milk, let's say. Um, But I wonder, are are you finding that Europeans are very prone to reading ingredients? So beyond the marketing label, they're they're actually looking at the contents? Yes, and and I think there's a difference here because obviously Europe Europe is (laughs) made up of many different cultures and also very strong food culture. So what I see, for example, uh, in the UK is that people either are uh, reading the labels and are going to a healthy diet versus many people who also opt for convenience. Whereas in a food culture like Spain, you see that that ingredients are super important and everybody wants to eat organic and natural foods. So that's, I think, also within Europe, there, there are big differences. And uh, we have to uh, yeah, include that in our strategies as well. So, uh, yeah, we, we, for the brands that I'm helping out with, we have different strategies for different countries, obviously. A hundred percent. But you mentioned Spain. So I have to mention her of foods. Um, I love them. They are so active. I've pulled up the website here. They've got chicken and beef. Are you a good rebel? See, I love their advertising. They've taken to responding to the Spanish government. I believe it's the Spanish government, not the, the particular lobby, but um, they have responded in Spain with some billboards about the environmental impacts of regular meat, animal agriculture. And they took some pretty hefty slack for that, but they've come back stronger. I don't know, you're an investor in um, Hero Hero Foods, and I wonder if you can comment at all. Yes, it's uh, absolutely, you're absolutely right. It's a fascinating story. And what I also love about them, their founders are animal activists. Very much so. And they thought, yes, and they thought about a more effective way to influence consumer behavior. And then they thought, okay, well, we can do a lot. We can uh, show images of the detrimental conditions of uh, farmed animals, which, well, rightfully so that they showed it. But they thought, well, we can make an even bigger impact if we start a love brand that's 
Spanish people embrace. And it's so cool to see now if you talk to young urbanites in Spain, in Barcelona or Madrid, they all love this brand. Yes. Uh, they have a 100,000 plus follower base on Instagram. Um, in, in, in mainstream restaurant chains, there's Eura on the menu. Uh, yeah. Mainstream retailers are selling this. And this is in a country that is heavily reliant on, on meat and dairy consumption. And that is also pretty traditional when it comes to food. So it's, it's super cool to see this, this brand, a local brand thrive in such a market and now also expanding to the rest of the world. And I also think one uh, comment you made about if we read uh, nutritional values, I think with Eura, they, they, uh, in, in Spain they do. And what they've done tremendously well is to uh, have a clean label product out there. Yes, again, I'm showing their website. I, I love them, as you say. Um, for many things that they do, it's not just how they communicate, um, because again, we were saying they have these great billboards and they've been very active and their their hearts are in the activism aspect of the food that they provide. But I think from a business standpoint, it's very interesting because when you think of who will succeed in business, you usually think of the Goliath, right? The, the one with the deep distribution channels and the huge pockets for advertising. But Gen Z and millennials have really shifted seeing through the commercialism and the uh, false health claims that are ubiquitous now almost on all food labels. And they've really gravitated towards the Oatleys and the Haura. I hope I'm saying that right. Haura. I'm Sorry, sorry, brand Huda is what I'm thinking. Um, you know, they've really connected with the zeitgeist of that younger consumer that wants to know the company values from top to bottom, not just the brand and what they offer, but those company values from top to bottom. That means CEO right down to the person on the customer service line. And they find that authentic, take a point of view, take a stand uh, way of communicating and acting in the world very powerful. And they're establishing what many big companies have lost, which is consumer trust. And so you're seeing these little Davids of the David and Goliath story take on a lot of market share. And it's a thrill to watch. You're, you're absolutely right. And I think these types of companies are arising all across Europe. So we, we really see a boom in entrepreneurship around the plant-based uh, scene. And I think I, I compare this to the tech industry 20 years ago. I, yeah. I, I was a tech entrepreneur and you really feel that, that energy that, that was taking place back then when I started my, uh, my agency um, 20 years ago to, to what is happening now in the plant-based scene. And rightfully so, because if, if we make the comparisons to technology, I mean, food is the new tech. And uh, if you look at, at, at other industries uh, where we've displaced animals with technology, like telecommunications, where we've replaced the pigeon with a phone, or, uh, or transportation, where we've replaced the horse uh, with, a, with a car, we can really see the same happening in the, in the food system. And um, yeah, therefore, it's, it's really cool to see these aspiring entrepreneurs now entering um, the food system to, uh, to change the status quo. Well, you hit on one of my very favorite subjects. It just gives me like a grin from ear to ear. So when anyone hesitates with me and they say, oh, you know, I don't know if plant-based is here to stay, or perhaps this is just a fad, or I don't know, it's not for me. I always say, well, then without sarcasm, I suggest you go invest in the typewriter because there's not an app or an invention, anything that you could do to the typewriter to make me go back. I now use something called the computer. And I think that's what animal agriculture is. For me, it's the typewriter. It served its day. I mean, not for me personally, I've been vegan for a long time. But back in the day, one could make an argument in the you know mid 1900s and the 40s or something, maybe the 50s, you could argue that it was the pinnacle of innovation in its time. It has outgrown it. There's nothing more you can really do to animal agriculture. And we've moved on from the typewriter to the computer and you're going to see that and the landline by the way <laughs> who wants to invest in a landline uh, so you know we've foregone the landline for the cell phone we've foregone the typewriter for the computer and this will be the case with animal agriculture so and we're living through it it will be the case willem in our lifetime so absolutely and and also uh, with that said we, we also need visionaries who think outside the box because when when henry ford was asked uh, ask people what mode of transportation they wanted. They all said, I want a faster horse. So you need visionaries who, yes. who, who develop a completely new line of products, uh, type of person like Ethan Brown and the founders of Oatly and Marco Loma of Eura. So we really 
Uh, and I'm thankful that these people are around. But 10, 15 years ago, we, well, maybe not us, but many people looked at them and thought, what are they doing? Are they crazy? But now it seemed that they were right. But they had the vision to, um, yeah, to, to build a whole new industry that, that is now flourishing. So I'm, I'm really grateful to these game changers who stepped in and saw that we needed to, uh, yeah, to displace animals from our food system. Yes, and it's so very exciting. It's one of the reasons why we highlight all the public companies in VegTech, the Vegan Global Impact and Innovation Index, because a lot of people don't realize just how many players are out there affecting this change which ultimately means it's not just that we're changing products. So we're going from a hamburger to a plant-based burger, let's say. Once you start changing products, you start changing ingredients. Once you start changing ingredients, you need to start changing the machinery that makes those ingredients. Once you do that, you're looking at different co-manufacturing arrangements. You're starting to look at different ways of farming. You're actually talking about changing the entire food supply system. So again, it's just a very interesting time to be alive and to be a part of it. Um, so we have got so much to talk about here. I'm, I'm going to move on to another subject. But before I do that, since we're already talking about Huda, uh foods and Mar Coloma out of Spain, I just might as well take the time to show some other websites of the companies that you invest in. So I've got Meetable here, which I am embarrassed to say that I had never, um, I, this was new to me to learn about Meetable. So let me pull up uh, their website. And maybe if you feel like taking us through what they do. Sure. Yes. So uh, Meetable is a SELAC company, and uh, they have developed a unique proprietary technology to um, pioneer uh, clean meat. And so uh, before everybody was using FBS as a growth medium, but they have been able to replace that with taking cells uh, from the umbilical cord um, and, and, and grow meat from, uh, uh, from uh, cells that don't need animal-derived products. And, if if you also look at the founder team, uh, I'm I'm always interested in in not just finding great ideas, but also great founders. Uh, the guys that you show here, Klein and Dan, they're they're just amazing. So Dan is a food scientist by heart, working at New Harvest in New York, and then coming back, he uh, uh, then uh, also had a spell at Moza Meat. And Klein is a is a CEO, and he has a McKinsey uh, background. So the two click. Uh, they are complementary to each other. They're positive thinkers they created an amazing uh, company culture and the company is just thriving and uh, i think they are uh, bound to become one of the the game changers within selag yeah it's really so very fun i did not realize um, I had not known about them. And when I went over their website, I thought they were sell ag, but I wasn't sure if it was something else. They said that they could grow meat in about three weeks, which usually takes, you know, at least a year and a half. And that's at the worst animal farming conditions possible. I'm talking about cows. Um, yeah. Chickens obviously take less, but still a lot of time, relatively speaking, and then in god awful conditions. So I wasn't sure if they were talking about precision fermentation or if they were talking about cell ag, but they're a cell ag company. Yes, they're a cell ag company, and they have patented Optiox technology uh, that was uh, invented by Mark Cotter from the University of Cambridge. And this technology enables them to grow meat faster uh, <laughs> than most others in the world. Oh, that's fascinating. Okay, I'm switching to another company just really fast. So you're also in investing in the Mighty P. I think people can see this. Um, and you are investing in Live Kindly. A lot of us probably know about Live Kindly and all the brands they have, fries like meat, oomph, and of course, the Live Kindly magazine. So uh, you've got your hands full with lots of investing. But maybe we should talk about that. Um, there are so many plant-based brands now. We can't invest in everything. Well, maybe you can, but I speak for myself. I can't. Uh, my my purse is so very, very tiny. How do you decide on what you're going to invest in? That's a great question. So there are a couple of things that I look for. Of course, an awesome product. Uh, and an awesome product for me is a product that is tasty, <laughs> first of all. So my wife and I do a lot of tastings here at home. <laughs> To, uh, to try all the all the all the products and sample the products that 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 I might invest in, um, uh, convenience. Um, yeah. So uh, is it yeah, um, easy to use and 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 uh, could it uh, reach a mass audience and availability? So what is their mm -hmm. uh, their their strategy when it comes to retail, food service, or or uh, convenience stores? And then obviously, uh, as I said, with the Meatable example uh, team. 
corporate culture, uh, and the, the founders, their background, but also their drive and motivation. I think the latter is for me more important than the first. I really uh, think that, that yeah, if, 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 if you have the right mindset, you can uh, reach any goal. Um, then uh, thirdly, uh, their, uh, their go-to-market strategy, uh, how that looks like, and uh, obviously also um, the product market fit. So uh, I always do my research and see what, yes. what the white spaces are in the market and to see uh, what products fill a gap and, and try to go on the lookout for these kind of game changers. Yes. When I'm looking, I'm because I have such small opportunity really in my particular case. So I'm always looking for something that's a direct replacement in the end product. And I wish I could be looking for the upstream, you know, the, the ingredients coming to make the product. I think there's a lot happening in novel proteins. I'd even like to be investing in infrastructure like machinery, et cetera. I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunities in vertical farming and, you know, all the way down, up and down the chain. Um, but for right now, I'm just looking for those one-to-one -one replacements, but I'd love to be able to get into, you know, plant-based fat ingredients that make the plant-based burgers that much better, et cetera. Uh, it's, it's a very exciting time and so much innovation going on in all of these areas. Right now, we only see the end product, you know, as consumers, that's what my listeners probably know. They only see the end product, but um, lots of innovation going on. This is why I say it's really a shift of the entire food supply system. Um, so tell me what you look for in a founder, because I always find that that's really the key to making any business work. <laughs> yeah, so uh, maybe the, the, the first word that comes to mind is, is humble and strong. So uh, the, 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 the combination of a founder that acknowledges, uh, uh, well, maybe not his weaknesses, but the, the, the areas where he should enable others to thrive and is a team player and uh, lets others uh, yeah, fill his, his gaps but also a strong leader that has a vision and that uh, is also able to um, turn that vision into reality. So getting things done is, is an incredibly important part of that. Um, and I think um, that, that, that founder should be a leader at first uh, and, and also be an example and lead by example. So these kind of things I try to assess, that's always uh, obviously yes. now uh, in a time where we only do Zoom calls, uh, a difficult one, but I uh, <laughs> I really try to, to to grasp the energy also from the screen to see if yeah uh, I have a, a type of entrepreneur on the other side of the table that that that, that clicks. Uh, a nice example with Marco Loma, for example, because you mentioned Eora. What I really liked about him as a founder is he turned the due diligence uh, around. So when I uh, reached out to him, it was like four years ago through LinkedIn. To send him a message well i tasted your product it, it's amazing i'd love to back your uh, your adventure and help accelerate your company and then he sent uh, back well great but there's a lot of investor interest so yeah. please send me a couple of references why we should pick <laughs> you as one of our investors yeah <laughs> and i really like that and i thought yeah you're right i mean this is like a marriage that we're on and, and you yeah. cannot get rid of me if I've invested in your company. So yeah. rightfully so that you also do due diligence on me. And I really like that aspect in, in fundraising and also that characterized him as an entrepreneur. He only wanted to yeah, select the people that he also felt a connection with and the, that he thought of that could bring smart capital. Yes, it's this really delicate balance of being humble yet bold being scrappy and yet visionary. So I look for the person that's really willing to work the long hours, roll up their sleeves, find the opportunity, make the connections, you know, within the realm of strong values, really work every angle and then be completely bold about what they're doing. No reservations, but having that humility to say, I might not know the right answer. I'm going to go find it and go find the right person who does know. So it's a very unique individual. They're, they're, you know, and I think a lot of, this is interesting. I think a lot of um, the allure of the plant-based market and the business opportunities are bringing in lots of founders, not all of them. You know, it's a very unique equation that constructs that perfect founder. So um, 
Interesting. But okay, as we talk about investing, you are joining us today from what city in in the Netherlands? Uh, I, I would call it Greater Amsterdam, but I'm just outside a village called Harlem, which uh, in New York uh, <laughs> is the name giver of uh, a borough in New York. So Harlem actually spelled the same way? Yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, H-A-R-L-E-M. It's 17th, yes, it's 17th century village here in the Netherlands. How fabulous is that? Well, I love Amsterdam. Of course, been there and love it. And um, I had back in the day, I don't even know if they do this anymore. So in addition to, I believe it's the Rembrandt Museum, which is there, which I love. And um, I did go to, is it, is it Guinness? No, of course it's not Guinness. That's Ireland. Heineken. Heineken Thank you. What's wrong with me? Beer brand. <laughs> I did. I did go to the Heineken tour and Gosh, they were nice. generous with beer. It was a little bit overwhelming at our like 10 a.m. tour in the morning. But I just, you know, the Anne Frank, I mean, just, I'm just hitting all the tourist sites. But I, I just loved it. We stayed there a long time and um, really enjoyed the whole feeling of the city. So such a beautiful place. But in addition to being a beautiful place, it also is really the European epicenter for plant-based innovation and one thinks like the Netherlands, this sweet little country that could, like, how, how is it doing this? But you've got Wagen Eingen University that is very big in research, very strong. Um, I didn't know this until researching my interview with you, but the Netherlands is the second largest exporter of uh, food beyond the United States. I did not realize this strong in potatoes, vegetable seed and onions. Uh, you've got at least over 60 companies working on food innovation and research. As you mentioned, Upfields hails from the Netherlands, but so does the vegetarian butcher. And, um, you know, the, the university, I believe, or no, it's Upfield, excuse me, is investing $58 million in a food science center. Lots going on in the Netherlands. Is the Netherlands as a country, would you say, generally embracing plant-based and plant-based innovation? And secondarily, um, is it the face for Europe of plant-based innovation? Tell me. Great question. And thanks so much for, for highlighting uh, my tiny home country. It's, uh, yeah, I'm it's, a fan. Great, great. Thanks so much. And happily invite you back to Amsterdam. We have lots of cool vegan restaurants nowadays. So uh, that, uh, that has changed for the better over the years. Um, yeah, I think, well, like you mentioned, uh, we've always been a, a, an, um, an exporting country and also exporting food products. And since we're so small, we needed to be efficient. So mm. uh, there has been a high focus on innovation in making the most out of this tiny uh, piece of, uh, of land. And that's uh, why Wageningen University, uh, they call it the Silicon Valley of food. They, they've really invested um, uh, already for, for tens of years in innovating uh, in the agriculture uh, scene. So there, there, there are a lot of cool innovations coming out of, of Wageningen. And I think the combination with the entrepreneurial spirit of the Dutch uh, is, is, is a great uh, character trait. So uh, you, you mentioned Heineken, there, there are many other companies that, that grew also as a startup to uh, yeah, uh, global leadership. And I think uh, this is something we want to replicate in, in the food industry as well. Um, the general appetite towards plant-based is improving, uh, as is in Sweden, the UK, Germany. So I think we're in, 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 in the group of front runners here in Europe. Uh, but the combination with Wageningen, with our focus on food technology, uh, and already having companies like Unilever uh, coming from the Netherlands, a combination Anglo-Dutch company, is already helping. So there are many people that have a background in FMCG and that uh, now see this 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 space and uh, which is also here in Europe booming and want to enter that. A nice example sitting here <laughs> in my house, which is my wife, she, she used to work for P&G and uh, Alt, which is the fourth, uh, fourth largest supermarket chain. And uh, yeah, uh, we, we went on a journey uh, where visiting friends in Zurich, they showed us movies around uh, about veganism, uh, conspiracy, what the health, and they explained to us about the detrimental effects of animal agriculture. So we turned vegan overnight and we both um, wanted to find our place in the ecosystem. So she also quit her job and she's now, uh, she was hired by the new EMEA director of Beyond Meat and she's running the marketing uh, side for Beyond Meat. And I'm, I'm an investor and I think we are an example of many other Dutch who also uh, ventured into the space. 
So, so much to unpack there because I was going to later on in the interview, ask you about why you went vegan. So you were on a trip visiting friends in Europe, in Zurich, excuse me, and they showed you conspiracy, what the health and overnight it happened for you. Is that right? Yeah, it, uh, all of a sudden clicked. Uh, it, it was yeah. funny because, well, before I was already uh, an environmentalist uh, from an early age, uh, I, I had laid solar panels on my roof and I was driving an electric car and really wanted to reduce my uh, carbon footprint. Uh, I was a gardener actually when I was younger, so oh, earning yes. uh, <laughs> living when I was uh, in high school as a gardener, so my love for nature was already there. And then, uh, yeah, as I said, uh, I was visiting Maria and Robert, and Robert is now at Blue Horizon, uh, and he, uh, yeah, he showed me these videos, and, and I was just like, why didn't I know this? Uh, I, it, 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 I was already not a, a big fan of, of meat and dairy, but yeah, all of a sudden it clicked, and and uh, and I said, yeah, we 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 changed to a plant based diet uh, immediately because yeah, this was the right way forward. Yeah. And the funny thing was, uh, before when I was in in South Korea in uh, 2002, um, I visited this mon monastery uh, where uh, in this uh, this monastery high up a hill, uh, these these monks were practicing sunmudo. It's a uh, martial art, an ancient martial art from Korea. And they thrived on a plant-based diet, but they were among the fittest guys that I've ever met. So I was already intrigued, like, how, how do they do this with uh, just eating uh, vegetables and fruits and, uh, and legumes mm -hmm. uh, and nuts and seeds? So I was already impressed by what you could accomplish from a plant-based diet when it comes to health. So I knew that area, but yeah, uh, with uh, the effects on the environment, it really clicked and it, it made yeah all the more sense to... Uh, to change to a plant-based diet. Yeah, once you know, you can't pretend you don't know. So when you see the facts, it's really hard to say, ah, oh, I'm not processing this information. So I think once you watch something like Cowspiracy and, and hats off to Kip Anderson, his new film, Seaspiracy, is coming out on Netflix the end of March. Um, so we can all look forward to, to that. It's hard to unknow what you already know. So it's um, very powerful what you're saying, I think. Well, so l let me ask you this because we are talking about these brands that you already support. I wonder if you have any words to American companies that might want to find distribution in Europe. In fact, I say selfishly, so through my company, Plant Powered Consulting, I work with a lot of brands and I have my first European client. It's very exciting. And together we're trying to launch in Europe a lot of American products. So help us. <laughs> what are your tips for, thank you, what are your tips? So it's really him, the founder, Fabio Matticoli. Uh, what are your tips for uh, U.S. brands getting over to Europe. Yes, a uh, great question. So, uh, first of all, if you if you look at the market size, where we're now a three and a half billion dollar market for for plant based products, but we will grow uh, in twenty twenty five to uh, around seven and a half billion. So it is a sizable market. I think it's similar in size compared to the U.S. Um, so it's it is a sizable market. And then just, again, there are many. Yeah. So sorry, I just want to jump in there because that's an important statistic. I want everybody to hear it. You're talking about 3.5 billion today in Europe. According to Market and Markets Research, the entire plant-based meats market, I believe they said, is 12.3 around the globe. Just wanting to let everyone know that the number you're talking about is yeah. Europe-specific. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Europe-specific. Yes, great addition. And then... Um, it is important to, as I said before, acknowledge the, the differences between the different countries in Europe. So ProVeg ha has just published an amazing report where they um, looked at all the different markets and analyzed how the plant-based uh, scene is evolving and, and which product categories are on the rise. And in, in that report, it, 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 made, it was made clear to me again uh, that, that our largest markets are, are Germany, uh, the UK, uh, France, Italy, and Spain, but the adoption rate and, and the growth percentages in, in uh, Germany and the UK are among the highest. So mm -hmm. I'd say look at Europe, not from uh, a single country perspective, but from uh, a regional perspective where country differences are big. Uh, and then the adoption rate, especially for US brands, I would say are also higher in Northern Europe. Um, as I said, the food culture is very strong in, uh, in Southern Europe, with the example in, uh, <laughs> in France showing. 
So I yes. think also to, to uh, behavior in Northern Europe tends to be more similar to, to US behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's an important characteristic. And then, yeah, it's all, all the question uh, how to go to market. Uh, we, like in the US, see a boom in, in online shopping. So there are now uh, online retailers uh, that are growing rapidly. Uh, there's Ocado in the UK. There's Picnic in the Netherlands and Germany. Uh, the vegan kind, so vegan-specific companies rising as well uh, yes. or, or for online delivery. So I think online delivery is, 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 is rapidly growing, but also Amazon is, is obviously <laughs> growing tremendously also for especially self-stable products uh, here in Europe. Um, and, and yeah, a recommendation also would be is, is to assess if you like to go it by yourself or, or if you want to find a, a distributor to help you out. Um, good thing about the uh, distribution landscape here is that the, there are a couple of distributors that I happily recommend who have tons of experience in launching plant-based products from the U.S., uh, into Europe and also helping out with the logistics, distribution, the labeling and all the different languages, uh, regulation um, and also uh, the go-to-market strategy in uh, uh, making sure that rotation speed go up once you have that that market entrance. Yeah, you're talking about on-shelf turns. Um, well, that's so very helpful. I do want to say ProVeg, you mentioned it before. They're a great resource. Um, you can also go to, you can see scrolling on the bottom of your screen, plant base.vc that's where willem is this is really the portfolio of what he invests in but um you know just as resources for you as you start to think about taking your products across the pond for those uh, businesses that are listening i know a lot of european companies come to me and ask the reverse question of how do i get to the united states and in a way if you are big enough to afford a distributor you, I don't want to say you buy that relationship. Don't. It's much more than that, obviously. But it's how do you get those things to turn once they're on the shelf if no one has heard of you? So it's really getting into the culture. And if you think, you know, the Tennessee culture is different than the Portland culture, the same as the true in Europe. So the UK culture is going to be different than the Spanish culture, the Portuguese culture, etc. So um, you do have to try bespoke methods of marketing and communications most definitely um but it's an exciting road please sorry uh elizabeth yeah if i may add i I think there's also a big difference between the urban centers versus rural areas so what we also see in europe is an uptake of 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 plant-based flexitarian and vegan diets especially in the urban areas um so um, don't spend your marketing budget on the UK as a whole, but maybe start pilot in London or in Germany. Focus on on the two biggest metropolitan areas where where also veganism is, veganism is 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 on the rise, which are Berlin and Hamburg. Um, so spend your money wisely. Uh, don't spend it all on on the German market, but go to these these urban areas first and get a get a sense of uh, of the market there and uh, your your target audience is in these these urban uh, cities and 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 yeah i think that's that's also a better strategy maybe pick like the five six uh, biggest cities and and uh, in europe uh, in the in the most important countries and then go to uh, the rest of the countries and, uh, and continent agreed we're starting in the uk we're starting in the uk and germany is next i can fill you in on all that later if you'd like to hear it. But um, okay, so we're talking about going to market. And we also talked about a little while ago, that Dutch entrepreneurial spirit. So tell me with your entrepreneurial spirit hat on, what are the products that you would like to see in the marketplace that aren't yet there? Yeah, so um, I'm very bullish on uh, on seafood, like you said, with Seaspiracy coming out. uh, there, there's a there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, I think we need innovation uh, in, in in seafood. Luckily, there are great companies in the market. Of course, we have good catch. And uh, well, I saw today that Ocean Hugger is uh, doing a new uh, TV the brand back. that will not die. Yes, it's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, Ocean Hugger, the uh, seafood company, saved yeah. the sea out of Canada. Uh, Sophie's. Choice, I believe it is Sophie's out of kitchen. Yeah. Sophie's, thank you. What's wrong with me? Sophie's Kitchen, and then uh, there's a Swedish company, Hooked. Yeah. Hooked, yes. So there's more and more options coming online, and that's not even talking about the cellular options, which would be coming out of Asia, like um, um, yeah, like Shiok Meats, and yeah. Avant. 
And Avant, yes, yes. So very exciting time. I'm also very bullish on seafood. Okay, sorry to interrupt. What's your next one? Yeah, that's 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 one. Uh, the second is cheese. Uh, we're we're cheese. in the Netherlands, uh, a cheese loving nation. And when I talk to many uh, of my vegetarian friends, they say, "Yeah, I know that cheese is bad for the environment, and I shouldn't eat it. And for uh, it's 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 also for animal welfare. It's 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 horrible, but it's addictive." They say to me. So there's a great company called Those Vegan Cowboys. Uh, and it's founded by the vegetarian butcher guys, and they, they're Dutch. Yeah, yeah. They, they, yeah, they rock, and and they are um, uh, making casein, the addictive element in cheese, uh, from fermentation technology. Um, so they, 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 yeah, they, they they want to replicate cheese uh, with eliminating animals from the supply chain. So that's that's a great effort. But I'm 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 obviously bullish on everything in fermentation technology and uh, in plant based uh, for cheese. There's a third category, since I'm also a father uh, of, of a young son who is a vegan. Um, it, it, I'm always, well, especially when he has friends over for uh, parties to, to find good plant-based kids brands. Yes. Uh, and I think that's an area that I'm, I'm really, if, if you're listening and you founded a uh, kids brand, please reach out to me because I think that's an untapped opportunity. I think, okay. um, go ahead, Elizabeth. I have a couple thoughts for you on that. Of course, you know about Els Baby Food. Now, your son yes. sounds like he's a toddler, not a baby. So, Els Food, if you're interested in this, folks, it's on VegTech, the Global Vegan uh, Impact and Innovation Index. So, uh, Els is a publicly traded company. Also, are you familiar with Dandy's Marshmallows out of my hometown of Chicago? I'm not. Uh, I would love to learn more about them. It's the only vegan marshmallow in the wow. world, the only vegan marshmallow. So I don't know if, if Dutch kids eat marshmallows as much as American <laughs> kids do, but marshmallows find their way into their lives with uh, roasting them and some more as we do yeah. this thing with graham crackers and chocolate and, and marshmallows. So Dandy's Vegan Marshmallows from the Vegan uh, Chicago Food Company. That's an option. And I know that they just launched in the UK. So they, they are coming to you. They're getting Super there. Cool. They're going to grow from the nice. UK. So yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I see my, what my you're saying. Now, yeah, my son is now eating uh, like raw organic chocolate uh, that is pure, very pure because my wife used to be the CMO of, of, of Love Choc, which is this uh, <laughs> chocolate uh, manufacturer. And he loves it, but when his friends come over, they say, what is this? I kind of eat this. So we really need to, to find like child friendly yeah. Uh, finger food snacks uh, yes. in, in the Netherlands we consume 80 million uh, fish fingers a year oh. um, so a vegan version of that there are some but they're, they're not on par yet um, mm -hmm. so we, we, we really need innovation in that space or uh, well obviously Matthew started this company called VFC uh, vegan fried uh, chicken I think yeah uh, nuggets are, are, uh, are, are a product that, that kids love as well but obviously also healthy its uh, product. So I think there's a, there's a lot of innovation um, that can be catered to to have better, uh, healthier, organic options to uh, to, uh, to uh, yeah to also embrace the kids community in this uh, in this movement. Mm -hmm. I love that you say that. And I'm going to take that with me and probably quote you on that, because I think that uh, that is really an untapped area. Kids snacks, obviously the snack market itself is going through the roof, but snacks, healthy snacks geared towards kids that are vegan, I think uh, is a big fat white space to anybody listening. Uh, okay, well, so we've, we're sort of wrapping up as we get to the end of this. But I wonder if you could, because we talked about this before in the green room, like, oh, gosh, it would be great to explain to people how the heck we got here. Americans eat 222 pounds of meat a year. I'm not meeting, eating any meat. That means that somebody else out there is eating my portion of meat on top of their 222 pounds of meat. Sweet Jesus. No wonder everybody's sick. So how the heck did we get here? And at the same time, if you could give me your predictions three to five years out where we're going. Great question. Yes. Yeah, so if I, if I look at it from a European perspective, um, after uh, uh, the, the, when we came out of uh, two world wars, our governments decided to uh, feed our malnutrition children and, and adults uh, protein rich foods. Uh, and they thought, well, uh, protein comes from animals. So they've invested heavily in factory farming um, and they've built this this system that is efficient, effective, but very unhealthy for uh, the planet, for the animals, and for our health. Um, and to reverse this system has been yeah, a complex assignment uh, because mm -hmm. of all these 
um, these these interests that are that are around. Um, so um, that historically, uh, this has been shaped over 50 years. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that it wouldn't take 50 years to, to revert it back. Uh, right. But I'm, I'm, uh, to be honest, uh, I think we, we in Europe have a government that is lagging behind and that, that needs to be influenced. So uh, ProVeg is here, GFI is here. There, there are great institutions now being set up. And I, uh, I'd love to see more on the policy and political side here in Europe. So I'm, I'm really endorsing uh, everybody who has a keen interest in, in yeah, changing the status quo uh, in Brussels, but also in the, the European capitals. And I think that that will arrive. So there's the party of the animals now here in the Netherlands and uh, they, they are, they are, their focus obviously is on eliminating animal agriculture. And it's, it's, it's um, now uh, a political party in many European countries. And from a consumer perspective, I mean, um, they will be the front runners because consumers in Europe are, are just embracing this change. Um, more and more great products are arising. So in three to five years, well, veganism has doubled in, uh, in two years, but it will uh, continue to double. And we, we continue to see a thriving industry where, where uh, just, yeah, we, we will reach the tipping point uh, and, and, and uh, cross the chasm to mass market. And, and I'm very confident that this will also happen in Europe, but we also need yeah, politicians to follow our lead. And, and that's really important. So the 171 you refer to uh, needs to get off the table and just all the subsidies that go to, to uh, animal agriculture. One third of the European budget goes to animal agriculture. It's just something that, that is ridiculous if you think about it. It's so there's a lot of work to be done, but from a consumer perspective and from a company perspective, I'm very bullish on the disruption of our food system here in Europe. Oh gosh. Okay. So where do I start? So much to get, so much to rattle down here. You have said so much. I want to make sure I hit on all of it. Okay. First of all, the Netherlands has a party of the animals. Okay. I just want to make sure everybody knows that there is a political party for the animals. I love the Netherlands. Secondarily, I am equally disappointed that governments lag. Now, I'm not that naive that I expect them to lead. Nothing happens because governments say so. People say so, and then governments get on board when their jobs are at risk. I, let's be realistic. Still, it's disappointing that there isn't more research being invested from the government's standpoint because you know, when you talk about the budgets of governments that are going towards supporting animal agriculture and promoting same to people and making them sick, you're talking about a very expensive endeavor. Ultimately, governments are about money and the, the money comes from us, the people, very expensive to fix these healthcare costs. So to be promoting something that is going to be so expensive for the people, for their quality of life, and then also their wallet is, is, sinister i'll say at this point because we know better when we didn't know better okay that was something but we know better now so get with the with the program it's encouraging to see countries like israel go so deeply into investing into cellular agriculture with companies like Aleph farms that they support and and others meet tech 3ds doing great stuff and uh, benjamin netanyahu also has an animal rights advisor and he's been very outspoken there you have seen some investment from the european union as I understand it, as part of their um, environmental purpose. You're seeing Canada invest, China's coming around. You're not seeing much investment come out of the United States. I wrote an article for the New York Times on this. It wasn't accepted, but I still wrote it. So I could tell you that, uh, yeah, we're not doing enough. So I'm looking to see more support from governments just like you are. And then one last little point that I want to clarify. You said, rightly so, that when governments were looking at feeding people because they were worried about an efficient way to get people food after World War II, they thought, okay, protein comes from animals. A scientific point here, protein does not come from animals. Neither animals nor humans create protein. Protein comes only from plants and microbes. Humans and animals have protein because they eat plants and microbes. So all protein comes from plants. Just want my listeners to, to wrap their minds around that one. Okay, so we're one last thing. So as we look towards governments to get with the program, and as we see this rapid 
adoption of plant-based eating, I think the key word for me there is rapid. The world moves at a much quicker pace than it ever did before. And I think we are going to see a shift, not just in consumption, but of the entire food supply system happen really rapidly. I'm saying in the next three to five years, I think fermented proteins are going to be on the shelf and it's going to be something that people accept and understand. What do you think? You're absolutely right. Uh, I also see a lot of innovation happening. So here in Europe, I've invested in a company called Microarena, and they turn residual food waste into um, um, mushroom microproteins, uh, which then can be used as a meat replacer. So there's really cool innovation going on. And and also, I think, added to, to the great summary you gave and, and the additions you made where protein comes from, I think in Europe, there has been a realization that big farms produce big flu. And with the zoonotic diseases coming from animals to, to humans, it, it also opened the eyes for many politicians and just and also general audiences to give us one additional argument to right. uh, change our diets. Um, so I think that's that's now a, a new realization that will also further accelerate the move towards a uh, plant-based world. Yes, because you know there's nothing to say that you can only have one pandemic. You might have several pandemics running at the same time. For example, Asian bird flu is still rampant in China, as is African swine fever. So, you know, and those can spread easily to humans, particularly African swine fever. So, and that would just decimate China. Already it's decimated their swine population, which means that they have to go get more. It's just an awful situation. But, um, yeah, eat you know, more only pork. <laughs> eco, please go only pork. Talk about someone that I love, David Young, truly moving the needle for the entire country of China. He is such a force to be reckoned with. Omni Pork and Green Monday and Green Common all happening in Asia because maybe, of David Young. Absolutely. And maybe there's there's also a cool company to mention in, in Europe because we have this company in Germany called Rügenwalder Mühle and they are a 184 year old family business. They're the biggest sausage maker in Germany. And obviously we all know that Germans love their sausages. Mm -hmm. But last year they got more than half of their turnover from veggie options and the founder and uh, well not the founder one of the the the, the great grandsons of the founder but he's now uh, running the company he said the sausage will be the new cigarette so change is going to come in europe if the the largest sausage maker now uh, sells half of their products uh, as veggie options that's a quote that will show up very soon on instagram sausage is the new cigarettes Amen to that. We don't have much time left. This has been such a treat for me. I hope that you will come back. I love talking with you. I love having my pulse on what's going on in Europe through you. So I'm grateful for that. A couple of quickie exit questions on our way out. If you are having a bad day, and sometimes during coronavirus, people have had many, is there a phrase that you tell yourself to get yourself back in the game? That's a great question. So, uh, I, I always try to uh, limit the distractions. So my quote has always been hocus pocus, keep the focus and go back to the core uh, at what I'm, I'm supposed to be doing. And that's eating healthy, sleeping well, uh, uh, giving love to my uh, family and friends and, uh, and exercising. Wow. You're, you're just a great human being. <laughs> Um, I love that phrase, hocus pocus, keep the focus. Okay, everybody, adopt that one. My last question for you, you're running around doing everything that you do for the plant-based world. You're making amazing strides for people, the planet, and animals. And whoops, you forgot to eat lunch. What is your favorite go-to snack? <laughs> well, uh, that, actually, uh, I recently invested in this company from the state called Drink Après. Uh, and oh, it's Drink just, Après, uh, yes. Yeah, it's a great founder, Sonny. And, and he, he just shipped me tons of packages so whenever i forget to eat lunch um, i'm getting one of his ready-made drinks it's supposed to be an after workout drink yeah. but their uh yeah their sea salt chocolate is just delicious so i'm, I'm just using that now as my uh, <laughs> my staple go-to uh, snack whenever i uh, i miss lunch I love that you say that because my refrigerator and freezer is just like you. I get so many plant-based products sent to me by all these different brands that I'm trying out. So um, I, I no longer have a favorite because there's nothing I go to time and time again because I'm constantly trying the newest thing that hasn't even been out to the public yet. So um, I'll do say when I tried Perfect Day and their ice cream, Brave Robot, which was my first time ever trying fermented proteins. It was like 
Hallelujah. We are here. This is the end. I was holding the end of animal agriculture in my hands. Wow. Like, when, when will you introduce them to Europe, Elizabeth? Uh, I'd love to try Perfect Day. Oh, it, it's the thing. It, it's the, it, it's ice cream. There's, there's no, it's the thing and it's the end. You wouldn't you'd never go through the wastefulness of animal agriculture. I'm not even talking obviously about cruelty. You'd never waste your time on animal agriculture. It, uh, yeah. We leave with the end of animal agriculture. Willem Blaum, I want to thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you for giving us all the news of Europe. We really do appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me, Elizabeth. And truly, uh, you do amazing work. So thanks so much for everything you do in the industry. I feel exactly the same. I am deeply grateful for all that you do. And thank you for helping to move the needle for people, the planet, and animals. Willem, don't go away. Everybody else, I will see you next week. Thanks for being here with me on the Plant-Based Business Hour. Together, we're changing our health, the health of the planet, and the health of our bottom line.